Well, hello. I didn't see you standing there. My name's Phoenix. The fire? Yes, of course. Please, come join me. I've got some awesome stories if you want to hear them. Gather around. There's room for everybody. Before I get started with the stories, though, let me thank the ones that are here, the reform members of Back to Ashes. Through scrutiny, Samantha Place, Lisa Radford, Tina Mead, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Mana Ash, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Membership? Oh, yeah. That information can be found in the description below. I'd also like to thank the ones that are here that helped me with my GoFundMe. That is also still open and found below as well. If this is your first time here, welcome. You can help support the channel. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Thank you. Now, with all introductions out of the way, pull in close because it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. So, sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or snuggle in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Camping Horror Stories. Just so everyone knows, right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read you the first story, there'll be an ad. And after that, you can enjoy all the stories with a crackling fire. Let's get started, shall we? A few years ago, me and my best friends went on a trip to this secluded cabin in the mountains. We were there for the entire weekend and had a blast. However, round about midnight on Friday, we heard blood-curdling screams and a loud crashing noise coming from outside. We thought nothing of it at first, but the screams continued, so we decided to investigate. What we found was something that no rational mind could ever have imagined in a billion years. We found ourselves staring at a bizarre creature which we can only describe as a cross between a goblin, a demon, and something completely unnatural. It had no eyes, only hollow black sockets, which gave it a completely hollow stare. The thing was covered in a thin sheen of drippy blood which glistened in the moonlight. It was busy hacking apart the lower half of a girl, whose upper body was completely naked. It had hacked her in half diagonally, from the waist, and was halfway through hacking off her legs. It seemed to notice us and let out a bestial roar. My best friend screamed and fainted. My other friend ran and hid. I froze in fear. We've never told anyone about this. Not our parents, not our friends, nobody. Even now, after years, I get nervous whenever I have an encounter with the woods after that night. We go out of there as soon as we could. No way were we going to stick around for nature's oddest work of art. The murderer was long gone, thank God. My family, along with four others, own a hunting cabin deep in the woods of Pennsylvania. When hunting season is out, the cabin becomes a vacation spot for these families. We would often all end up there during 4th of July weekend. One year, my parents decided to take me, my uncle, three years older than me, and my two childhood friends up to the cabin for Easter. My parents decided to go out to the bar for a bit and leave us kids at the cabin alone. The youngest of us was seven at the time and the oldest was 14. It's cold and there is eight inches of snow on the ground. The sun has started to set and the four of us have gathered around the table in front of the wood stove and are playing Uno. We have several battery operated lamps set about in the cabin as well as two outside to light the walkway for my parents when they come home. Just as we are finishing a game and getting ready to take the 30 yard walk to the outhouse, we start to hear the snow below the window crunch. Being kids, we all got a bit uncomfortable, but reminded ourselves that we were in nature and it was probably just deer. Finally, after coaxing me and the other two girls convinced my uncle to peek out the window, he said he saw nothing. 
As soon as he sat back down, we started to hear a low grunt and a heavy creaking sound on the front porch. Now, before my parents left, they gave my uncle keys to the gun cabinets and a rundown on what gun to use if there was trouble. So, like any good protector, he arms himself. We hear heavy breaths and heavy paws on the porch just on the other side of the door. Those heavy paws then start to crash repeatedly into the front door. All four of us ran upstairs and locked the wooden door like it would provide any kind of protection from the 400 pound black bear that was trying to break into our cabin. About 10 minutes go by and we finally hear the front door fall and the bear is in the cabin with us. He rummaged through the downstairs for about a half hour. As a small frightened child, it felt like forever until he finally left. Never attempted to come upstairs for us, thank God. My parents were happy we were all right and never left us alone that long again. Camping with family and friends up in the mountains. Sharing a tent with my brother, we'll call him Luke, and another friend, we'll call him Evan. Luke, Evan, and I weren't tired when everyone retreated to their tents for the night. But the fire was dimming out and we were bored so we went inside our tent to watch Adventure Time on my laptop until it died. We all passed out after a few episodes and I woke up sometime during the night into an episode of sleep paralysis. I have weird sleep habits and experience sleep paralysis every few months or so. For those who haven't had it, basically you're awake but you cannot move and sometimes experience auditory or visual hallucinations. I was aware of this, so I didn't have a full-on heart attack when I started hearing shuffling noises outside my tent which continued and got louder and closer until the fabric of the tent itself was being touched by something. My computer hadn't yet died so I could see my surroundings in the dim light of the screen. I watched the fabric compress as something pushed against it sporadically about four feet off the ground, then moved around the tent towards me. I watched three distant impressions follow this creature around the side of the tent. It looked like a claw. I was terrified and filled with adrenaline, but another part of me remained calm, assuring my body it was all a dream. I couldn't do anything anyway, so my fear was pointless. But as I continued to observe it, my sleep paralysis began to fade, and I realized I could start to move. No longer so convinced I was dreaming, I reached over and shoved Luke awake. I tried to get him to look and see if there was really something there, but I must have sounded like I was sleep talking because he just rolled over and went back to sleep, waving me off. Eventually, the rustling stopped, and I was tired and groggy enough that I quickly fell back asleep. In the morning, I had completely forgotten about it, that is, until my brother-in-law, who was in the other tent, We'll call him Dean, said to us, It's a good thing we put the dog in the car last night. There was a bear here while we were sleeping. Dean pointed out that the tree where we'd strung up our trash, so animals wouldn't get into it, and the fresh gaping claw marks about nine feet up the trunk. It hit me like a truck. I had seen the bear and calmly watched it test the fabric of my tent, 12 inches from my face. About a year ago, I got an Alaskan Malamute puppy. I was so excited to have a dog. I wanted to go hiking with him, camping, and travel. It was fall in Iowa, so it can get pretty cold for camping. So I decided to start researching cabin rentals. I had found an amazing cabin in Wisconsin on Airbnb. It was fully loaded, very secluded in the middle of the woods. Had a hot tub, internet, full table, great kitchen. This cabin was so beautiful, 
and it was pretty cheap to rent. The first time I had visited this cabin, I had a great time. It was just me and my dog. I relaxed. We went hiking. I cooked a great dinner, and I slept pretty well. I only stayed one night, just a quick getaway on my day off from work. After getting home, I told my friend Martha about this great cabin, and she was eager to want to take a trip up there with me. We decided to go up the night before Halloween. We took off, just Martha, my dog, and myself. That night we had a blast. We drank, cooked dinner, chilled in the hot tub, then decided to watch scary movies since it was so close to Halloween. I was pretty drunk, but when I was standing in the kitchen, I could have sworn I'd seen Martha run down the basement stairs, which were right off from the kitchen where I was standing. Then, I looked over into the living room, and Martha was sitting on the couch watching the movie. I was so freaked out, but again, I was also drunk, so I kind of blew it off. We both ended up passing out, and nothing too exciting happened. What happens the next morning is what has made me a solid believer in the paranormal. I was always sort of a skeptic when it came to ghosts. I had some experiences that were weird, but I could somehow justify it as something else, so I always had doubt in the back of my mind. But that morning, we were pretty hungover. We ate a little breakfast, then decided to go sit in the hot tub. So I decided to lock my dog in his crate, and we went outside to get in the tub. It was so magical because it was literally Halloween, and it was dumping down snow. We sat in the hot tub for maybe 15 minutes. I could have sworn I heard a bang inside the cabin, and my dog was barking at something. We got out and ran inside to the kitchen since it was so cold. Then we literally froze in our footsteps. The entire kitchen was torn apart. All the cabinets were open. The refrigerator door and the top freezer door were open. The bar chairs were all flipped onto their backs. Drawers were open. Pans were thrown off shelves. Martha's phone was charging on the counter and it was unplugged on the floor. I have no other explanation than paranormal. My dog looked terrified, but there is no way he tore the kitchen apart. He was still a puppy, so he wasn't that big, and he was still locked away in his crate. Before we went outside, the kitchen was a little messy from our night before, but nothing like what we walked into. The kitchen was trashed. I know Martha didn't do it because we both went outside at the same time. There was also no way someone broke into the cabin to do it. We were in the middle of nowhere, and it was snowing, so there would have been footsteps, and the hot tub sat right next to the long driveway leading to the cabin, and we would have seen someone drive up for sure. I just have no other explanation on why that happened. So now I am a believer, and so is Martha. I'm sure my dog saw some crazy stuff. We left pretty soon after this happened, and believe it or not, I actually stayed at this cabin again, multiple times, and nothing ever happened again. Maybe Halloween stirred up the spirits and they just wanted to be heard or seen in some way. Maybe I really did see a ghost the night before as well. Who knows what crazy things have happened in this cabin. It's really, really old. This happened when I was in year 5. I would have been 10 or 11, so quite a while ago, but I still remember. So, at the time, we were on camp. My first one, by the way. And we were meant to listen to this person tell stories or something. I don't remember, but it isn't important. Sadly, they couldn't come because something sad had happened, so instead we went on a night walk outside of the campsite. The walk was pretty normal and actually quite fun until we stumbled up upon these little cute fairy homes built into a tree. As we all looked at the tiny houses, we noticed you could open one of the doors, so we looked inside, and what we found was rather spooky. It was a note saying, be back in five minutes. Now, this may not seem that scary, but 
Just you wait. Anyway, we carried on and kept walking. Later on, we stumbled upon a lake, and as we looked across it, shining our light so we could see, we saw something rather strange. Parked on the opposite side were a few vans and cars facing us. We were instantly spooked, and to make things worse, we started to see people walk around. You could tell something wasn't right, because even the teacher seemed to be scared and were very nervous. The doors of the van were open, and I believe something was inside, but I can't remember. If you'd like, I can ask friends if they know. Nevertheless, it scared us even more, and soon after, we left and headed back to the ferry and gnome houses. On the way back, our curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to check if that note was still there. It was not, and that sent shivers down our spines. We left straight away, and for the rest of the night, we wondered who took the note. I doubt it was one of my fellow classmates, because we were all looking at it, and there's no way we wouldn't have seen them take it. If someone didn't, though, who in the hell did? Was it those people across the lake, or some random person who was also walking on the trail next to the highway at 10 o'clock at night? I wonder if people saw us looking at them. Does anyone have any ideas? Where I live, there are huge swaths of forested land that is miles and miles from any sort of civilization. Being a good old country boy, I spent a lot of time camping along the DNR roads. One year, we were camped out on the side of a little mountain and spent the night drinking and whatnot. The next morning, nobody wanted to cook, so we decided to drive into a town, 20 miles away for breakfast. As we were exiting the forest, we came upon a police blockade. The sheriffs had their AR rifles pointed at us and told us to park the vehicle and walk towards them with our hands in the air. We followed instructions and they told us that a forest ranger had been shot the previous night. I later found out that she was shot about 300 feet below our campsite. We probably heard the gun, but in that part, it wasn't unusual for people to be shooting in that area. We were told that we couldn't go back for our camp gear, as the killer was still on the loose. Instead, we drove to a nearby casino and got back to the revelry. A few hours later, the gas station next to the casino is packed with sheriffs, PD, FBI. Every LEO within 50 miles must have been there. As it turns out, the killer was spotted at the gas station, and an officer who happened to be there recognized him. When the LEO told him to get on the ground, the killer reached for his gun, at which point the LEO shot and killed him. It was so strange that we were within a few hundred feet of where he killed someone, and then hours later, a few hundred feet from where he was ultimately killed. Needless to say, we drove back to our campsite that night a little sombered, then proceeded to get shit-faced. I'll have a go at the supernatural aspect of this question. This was maybe seven to eight years ago, when I was 20, and in a really bad way. I'd been messing up my life via heroin for the past year, but after lots of help and love and luck from friends and family, finally was getting my head cleared, almost there, above the black tar hell I'd gotten myself into. I decided to get out of the city and drove two hours out to a smaller town in Missouri, where Google Maps told me a small campsite by water was. I knew there shouldn't be very many campers because it had just gotten cold, above 40 or so at night. Nearly there, as I'm driving down a misty morning road, just a picturesque straight two-lane highway, there's this object laying in the road about a half mile up. I slow my approach and can see it's this shaggy mutt just hanging out. 
I stopped and rolled down my window right next to it. She came up, licked my hand, and wagged her tail a bit. She seemed to expect something out of me. She had no tag, no tattoo for Chip. I laid her check, by the way. Just a dog with no name. Naturally, I popped open the passenger side door for her, and she was glad to hop in. So now I got this dirty but friendly companion for my little excursion. The dog with no name. The entrance to the campsite was about a half mile further, and as I suspected, there was no one around. I just dropped a five in the honor box and picked the site closest to the stream. I set up my tent, the same one I'd set up for years with my dad as a kid. Collected some dry sticks, not hard to do this time of year, started a fire. The dog with no name just circled the campsite looking content enough to sniff some leaves and roll around in the mud. I'd went to check out the rivulet, about 30 feet wide. It had a man-made stone dam you could walk across. To the west was the deeper part of the river, sort of pooling at the dam. Then maybe an eight-foot drop to the east into calmer streams. Instantly, I wanted to go on, cleanse myself, symbolize, baptize, whatever. I grew up Catholic, so that kind of shit runs through my head to this day, though I'm far from religious. The dog sees me scoping it out the whole time from the campsite. I can't bring myself to do it, though. I'm hugely disappointed in myself, but it's cold. It's brackish. I don't have a towel. So I go back up to smoke cigarettes, eat hot dogs, pet the dog with no name. Night falls quickly after all this mediation, and I roll inside the tent to sleep. My buddy sleeps inside the tent next to the sleeping bag. This dog was effing awesome, if you couldn't tell that yet. I wake up for no reason I can put my finger on, and my main source of warmth, dog with no name, is missing. I slide out of the tent. I guess I left it unzipped. And there she is, just sitting waiting for me in the pitch black, wagging her tail. I feel very strange, like something is happening here, and someone or thing is telling me to get back down to the river and do the damn thing. We walk down the short trail together, surrounded by Missouri black. It's even colder than before, but I start to strip anyway, standing on the chilly stones of the dam. The dog with no name sits on the edge of the river, again, just watching me, a slight wag. I'm now stark naked as can be, staring into this black pool that looks like some supernatural ink. I should mention here that I hate swimming in water that I can't see the bottom of. My fearful imagination takes over and I freak out. In other words, I stand naked on the dam for over 10 minutes before I finally muster up the balls, albeit shriveled in tiny balls, and just say to hell with it and dive right into the blackness. It was cold as hell. It was scary as mm, you know what. When I came up for air, I was thrashing wildly back towards the dam, scrambling back onto the slick stones. I shook out my hair and was surprised how the adrenaline helped me in keeping warm. As I pick up my clothes and shoes, I look over for my buddy at the river's edge. The dog with no name is nowhere in sight. Back up at the campsite, I'm looking around, gently whistling, that kind of thing. I'm more than woken up now, so I go ahead and start another fire. Dawn is just starting to break. I have another hot dog for breakfast and figured I might as well just pack it up and leave. This trip feels more than complete. As I start my car up and check my phone, There is an hour time difference between the two. This happened to fall on daylight savings time. I'm not calling it a supernatural rip in time. But it is funny that the night this went down, in fact, the exact time would be around 3 to 4 a.m. that the dog disappeared. So, the dog never showed up again. I never shot up heroin again, either.
An old guiding buddy of mine told me this story, and while I wasn't there myself, this happy-go-lucky hyper fella got real pale and quiet while telling it. He would only tell it to me in the daytime, after weeks of badgering, and it was the only time I saw him scared in all the months we spent leading groups around the Appalachia. I've been meaning to write this one down for a long while, so I'm going to tell it as close and as well as I can. He calls it the Gizmo Story. This will be edited to remove names. I'm going to call my buddy Mark. Mark went camping in a state forest in Virginia with a group of his college friends. They were a small group of four from the outdoor rec department, experienced kids with all the necessary gear and familiar terrain. Being college kids, however, they rolled into the campsite fairly late and decided to just car camp. Camping near the car, no hike to a separate location. It was early evening, but still, before the sun had set at least. As they were unloading the car and setting up camp, two mangy fellas came out of the woods and approached them. These guys looked like they'd been living out there for quite some time. Not that there's anything wrong with that and acted very odd. They wouldn't look you in the eye and seemed real twitchy, just kind of hanging around like they wanted something, like coyotes. My buddy Mark, he got the gitchy feeling right away. The guys introduced themselves. Now, nobody I've spoken to can remember the first man's name. It was something unremarkable like Bill or Rick, but the second guy, he said his name was Gizmo. Funny name, hard to forget. So Gizmo and his friend start asking questions. Questions like, Y'all fixing to stay the night? How much food y'all got? When are you kids supposed to head home? Y'all got phones on you? Any more y'all planning on showing up? Well, Mark didn't like that one bit. So he started telling tales. Yeah, um, there's going to be eight or ten more of us showing up tonight. Our parents expect us home first thing tomorrow morning. They're super paranoid, so we got to get home on time or they'll call the cops. Parents, am I right? <laughs> that sort of thing. Gizmo and company poked around camp a bit more, then wished the group good luck and disappeared back into the woods. Mark and his friend joked nervously about Gizmo and his friend but weren't worried enough to actually leave. They built a fire and cooked dinner, then cleaned and hung up the bear bag. They spent the rest of the evening hanging out around the fire, chatting and drinking. One of them had a harmonica, I think. By midnight, they had all turned in. They had brought two tents, a girl's and a boy's. Well, Mark didn't feel right sleeping in the tent. He felt like somebody needed to keep watch so he laid down by the fire. Sometime later, Mark found himself awake. The fire was dying when he opened his eyes, and he couldn't see much beyond the campsite, except for one bright burning spot. There was a light out in the woods. It bobbed along at chest height, occasionally disappearing behind the trees, sometimes pausing. Whoever it was was at a good distance, maybe a hundred yards out. When he told me the story, the distance was between here and that tree, so I can't really be certain. He followed it for a while until it went out. He stared at the darkness for a long while until eventually he fell asleep once more. Suddenly, Mark woke up again, this time in a panic. The fire was down to embers, barely glowing. He opened his eyes to see that the strange light in the forest was back, and it was way closer now. He could see now that it was from a lantern. He watched as a lantern carved a smooth perimeter around the campsite, occasionally going out, always reappearing a short distance away. Mark pretended to roll onto his back in his sleep so he could watch. It circled the campsite twice, getting closer each time. The strange thing is that there were no sticks breaking, no leaves crunching. Somebody traipsing around in the dark woods that close should have made a lot more noise. 
whoever it was, was trying to be real quiet. Mark lay there, tense and unmoving. By the time it began, its third rotation of the campsite, the lantern was so close that Mark could see a face illuminated in it. It looked like one of the fellows from earlier. He couldn't remember which one. His eyes were bugged out, scanning the campsite like a predator, and he was sweating. Then, the lantern went out. At this point, Mark woke up. He got up and started making lots of noise, stoking the fire, packing his gear. His watch read that it was 4.30 or so, and the sun wasn't up yet. He considered all that had happened, and made the tough call to wake up his buddies and bug out. Nobody argued when they saw his face. Like I said, this guy is happy-go-lucky, a human golden retriever, and an experienced woodsman to boot. You'd believe him too, trust me. The sun was barely starting to come up by the time they got in the car. As they were driving out, they passed something they hadn't noticed on the way in. There was an old RV parked out in the woods, camouflaged with a mixture of earth-colored tarps and actual greenery. It was surrounded by a chain-link fence, which was also draped with camp tarps and leafy bows. The whole thing looked like a long-term hunting campsite. Mark and his friends were actually relieved. Gizmo and his friend must have been poachers, and that would explain their creepy stalking behavior. They had been trying to scare the kids away from their hunting site, Scooby-Doo style. Still cautious, they hightailed it out of there and counted their lucky stars that they weren't deer. That should have been the end of the story. This next part, I don't understand. I don't know why Mark or his friends didn't tell anybody about Gizmo for a few weeks. I would have thought for sure he'd report poachers ASAP. He's very type A, and it's not typical for him to procrastinate or let a rule go unenforced. I don't know what his excuse was, but Gizmo and his pal were forgotten. Then, one day, Mark mentions the incident to a law enforcement officer from the DNR that came and lectured at one of his classes. She asks casual questions at first, just being polite, but then stiffens at the mention of the name Gizmo. By any chance, do you remember the other guy's name? She asks. No, I, it was something normal. I don't remember. God, they always say that, she replied. Turns out that a part of this woman's job was investigating the murders that occur in VA state forests. Most are body dumps for crimes that occurred elsewhere, but over the last decade, a series of unsolved cases, stretching all the way into West Virginia, had targeted what appeared to be random, unrelated campers. But when they interviewed others camping in the area around the time of the murder, they all mentioned the same uncanny detail. They had all been approached by an individual named Gizmo and another man whose name nobody can ever seem to remember. A group of friends was staying at this remote cabin that one of my friend's cousins owned. There were no roads leading to the cabin, and it was a good three-fourths day hike from where you parked the cars. I couldn't go at the same time as everyone else due to work obligations, so I decided to head up the same day, but later. It would mean I would have to camp for a night by myself, though. The latter part of the trail is too dangerous to be taken at night, especially by someone who doesn't know it. I didn't care, though. I was kind of looking forward to it, as I've never camped alone before. So, I was in the middle of those woods when the sun went down. I got my camp set up in this small clearing, probably 40 feet across, get my campfire going and pitch my small one-person tent. Do all that camping stuff like cooking hot dogs on a stick over the fire and s'mores. I'll probably stay up for a good two or three hours after dark. It was mid-autumn, so the days were somewhat short. The entire time, I thought I heard shit moving in the woods on the edge of the clearing. I didn't think anything of it at first because the woods are full of animals, but as the night went on, 
I realized that whatever it was, was just circling the clearing over and over. Once I started paying attention, it made four or five laps around before I decided to get up and investigate. The noise stopped as soon as I stooped up, and I thought I heard some sound going away through the woods. I just shrugged it off, thinking it was some fox that was curious that got scared when I stood up. I decided it's time to sleep, douse the fire, and climb into my tent. I start to doze off and stay in that half-sleep, half-awake state for a while. I normally hear weird shit when I'm in this state, so I don't think much of it when I hear a voice. Something wakes me all the way up, though, and I realize the voice is real and right outside my tent. It's just above a whisper, and I'm not sure if it was another language or if they were just speaking English in such a way that I didn't understand it. I lay there for some time, I don't know how long, listening and waiting for something to happen. There is just enough moonlight to light up the walls of the tent, so I can see when a hand presses into the wall of my tent down near my foot. This freaks me out and I sit up quickly. Whoever was outside of the tent tore ass out of there, like running full sprint through the woods. I get out of the tent and shine my flashlight around and see nothing. I was expecting there to be a bloody handprint on the tent, but nope. Didn't sleep that night, packed up camp at first light that morning, and hauled ass to the cabin. I used to, and still am be a scouts leader, and each year we go during the New Year's period to a camping site. Being in Canada, New Year weather is pretty damn cold. Think negative 20 degrees Celsius to negative 30 degrees Celsius. So the camping is done in lodges. The lodge we slept in had no toilets, so each night before we went to bed, I'd round up my scouts and walk them to the bathroom, which happened to be in another lodge at about a minute's walk. That year, I happened to have two really immature kids, and they were taking too much time to get ready, so I sent my scouts to the washroom and told them that I'd catch up to them once the two guys would stop mucking around. A few minutes later, we were on our way, By then, most of the children had already brushed their teeth and went to the toilet. When I finally enter the lodge, I can see that most of them had congregated around the bending machine in the hallway across the toilet. So I enter the toilet with the two kids that were with me, and I check to see if there is anybody in the stalls. Is anybody in the toilets? Yes. I recognize the voice of Jay, one of my scouts. I then proceed to brush my teeth. A few minutes later, I ask again, Is everything good? Yes. This time, I recognize the voice of another kid, W. At the moment, I make nothing of it and assume I just misheard the voice the first time around. Another couple of minutes have passed and even the two difficult kids I was with have finished prepping themselves. So I ask, Is everything good? Nothing. So I asked the two kids to start opening the stalls to see if something had happened to W. There were about eight of them, all empty. The two kids start freaking out because they also heard the voices. Since they had been using the sink, which was right by the door, there was no way for someone to pass without being noticed. So I send them to the shower stalls again. No one. The two kids were now becoming really agitated, so I decided it's time to regroup in the hallway to head back. Back in the hallway, I see both J and W, both who deny having entered the washroom after I came. To this day, my scout squadron refers to the incident as the poop monster incident. So, here's a story of mine that scared the ever-living shit out of 1998 me. I live in Pennsylvania, 
until I was one month shy of being 12. I know that exact date because you had to be 12 to hunt in Pennsylvania, and I was looking forward to it. Anyways, we moved to Florida, and I get to hunt down here too, so that's okay. I had a few good friends that lived right down the street from me. We lived out in the country. My address was literally 1691 blank blank road, middle of nowhere. So, we'd hang out at my buddy's place, or we'd go up this hill for about a half a mile until we reached the burn pile and cabin at the top. It really was a basic cabin. Outhouse, no lights, nothing. We'd hang out there, use it as a fort for nerf battles, manhunt, CTF, etc. Well, one night my friend invited a few of his friends and cousins up to the cabin so we could roast marshmallows and play manhunt. There were something like 13 of us to start, but the number slowly went down to 10 by nightfall. So we played manhunt, 5 versus 5 in the dark. Around 11 p.m., we were in the middle of a game and two of my friends had hung back with me because we were the fast ones. We realized that there were only three of us left on our team and that we hadn't captured anyone from their team. We tried to make a jailbreak and lost my friend. We'll call him F. It was just myself and another friend that we'll call L. L and I were a hundred yards from the other team and they had three of our five players now in their jail. They began to press our side more and mess with us until one of them told us we were cheating. L and I looked at each other, unable to figure out why. Our side had about one-fourth of it covered heavily in trees. The other side was about the same, with both wooded area near the back of the sides. At one point, when we were chasing someone off our side, I saw L and I running in the same direction, and someone on the other side of L. I quickly cut behind L and intended to surprise the other person and nab them on our side. I was probably the fastest person there, and I didn't want to be the one on the team to capture nobody. Once I emerged from behind L's trajectory, we were both running by the way, I saw absolutely no one, nothing, no trees, no scarecrow, absolutely nothing that I could have mistaken for a person. I surmised that there had to be someone from the other team hiding behind our lines, waiting for us to cross over and then tag us there. Well, the game ended up dwindling down to us with two left and the other side with four. We capped one person and then all parties were exhausted. I asked the other team, mostly L's cousins, who was behind the line waiting to cap us. No one claimed responsibility, of course. I figured it was someone trying to mess with us. Back at the cabin, we start cooking hot dogs and marshmallows over a fire. We were all 10 to 13-ish, with one person being maybe 15. It was an older cousin. So we were drinking soda and not beer. Note, if this had been beer and I'd been older, I'd just chalk this up to be booze. All 10 of us are around the fire when we saw someone coming up the hill. It's hard to see outside in the dark when you've been staring at a fire for a while, but at least four of us had seen the person, so we figured it was one of the people who left coming back, or someone new. After about half an hour, no one came up. We went and looked and found no one. Being the intelligent young kids we were, we decided to investigate further. It's summer, after 12 a.m., and we're out playing with fire and flashlights, looking for a mystery person. Yeah, we were not honor students. We went to the path that led down the hill and could clearly see my friend's house in the distance. They left the outside lights on for the dogs, and no one in between. Someone was trying to mess with the group, so they ran into the woods and came out directly on top of us, scaring the shit out of everyone. After we all changed our pants and regrouped, we headed back to the cabin, only to see someone on the very far side of the clearing. There were three of us with flashlights, and all of us attempted to illuminate this one person, but we were too far away to get a good look. As soon as we lit him or her up, he or she disappeared into the woods. Okay then, now a few of us are freaking out. 
Six people decide to go down to my friend's house to spend the rest of the night where the axe murderer from hell won't be able to get them. Since they have six, the four of us who decided to rough it are only four. The group of six got two flashlights. I was the only one left with one. We decided to figure out who this was. L had an uncle who was only 10 years older than him, who we figured was just messing with us. We knew his place was less than a mile from where we were. Big extended family, large family plot of land. L, F, one of L's cousins, gonna call him C, and myself began to walk across the clearing. Once we were about 40 feet from the edge of the woods, we could hear someone moving around in the brush. Not stomping or anything, but very carefully moving through the fallen sticks and underbrush, trying to make as little noise as possible. We figured it was L's cousin. We'll refer to him as Uncle Jay. So we split up again, and two people waited in the clearing, F and L's cousin. And myself and L went into the woods to try to flush out Uncle Jay. We figured F and C could see okay from the clearing, and to be honest, they actually could. L and I eventually were about 50 feet into the woods, further than we thought we needed to go, when we heard this low rumble noise. This is one of those times when I regretted trying to act macho. L and I kind of look at each other to make sure it was neither of us rumbling, and basically just stopped dead in our tracks. I shine the flashlight up in the direction of the noise, directly away from the clearing and the fire, and couldn't see anything. There was just nothing there. It was, to this day, one of the most eerie noises I have ever heard. Like a noise a Halloween decoration would have made, but real. We stayed at about 50 feet into the woods, never venturing much further in, and searched the general area never found anything. After about half an hour of this, it's now past 2 a.m., we heard a noise just at the edge of the clearing and both of us turned around. I had expected it to be F and C coming to figure out what the heck was taking us so long. But instead, I see one person basically hiding halfway behind a tree looking at us. I've never not wanted to shine my flashlight on something before that moment. If it was dark, I wanted to see what it was. But in the distance, well past the shadowy character, I could see F and C milling about the fire. I had this awful feeling that there was no way Uncle Jay was being this creepy. I didn't want to see who it was, and I really just wanted to get away from this person. I mean, the hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. L must have seen it too because he started slowly backing further into the woods. We moved in as wide a circle as we could around the shadowy person and managed to make it back to the clearing. We got back to the cabin and grabbed F and C and began to make our way back to L's place. When we were about a hundred yards from the cabin, we heard its door slam and we freaking bolted. When we made it back to L's house near the bottom of the hill, we debated what to do. Should we call 911? Was that a trespasser? Or was that simply a family member messing with us? L went to go notify his parents, who we figured would be overjoyed at the premise of being woken up at around 3 a.m. by a bunch of sweaty, terrified 11-year-olds. They weren't home. Apparently, L's grandfather had had a heart attack at around 10 p.m., None of us had cell phones as it was 1998, and so no one had been notified except for L's 19-year-old step-cousin. I really never figured out this relationship, to be honest. Who had drank himself near blackout drunk as soon as the adults left him in charge of all the younger kids up at the cabin. Seriously, he got reamed the next day by basically every adult in attendance. That meant that Uncle Jay and basically every other of L's family members who could have been messing with us were at the local hospital with the patriarch of the family who'd had a mild coronary. At 4 a.m., we knew sleep wasn't an option and began to watch and wait for the shadow guy to show up at the bottom of the hill. Less than 10 minutes later, I hear a sound coming from upstairs. Only problem is, there's no upstairs to L's house. 
there's something, or maybe someone, on the roof. L grabs his pellet gun. So that's going to be super effective. And we go outside. Because, you know, we're smart and stuff. We shine every flashlight straight up at the roof and see a completely black silhouette jump off the far side of the house into a mad sprint. The way L's roof was shaped, the part he, or it, jumped off of was over 25 feet high. There was a huge vaulted ceiling in the back room of the house, and the roof was even taller to accommodate for the attic. We watched it run away from the hill and towards the creek, 10 feet wide, maybe 2 feet deep and we followed it until we realized how much faster it was than us. Once it reached the edge of the creek, it stopped and looked back at us. This rumble thing came back and it jumped the creek and we lost it. The next day, we told Elle's parents and they informed us that the cabin was being torn down. A cow had been killed and dismembered in the freaking cabin early that morning, presumably after we left. It could have been a panther. Cows weren't uncommon on that part of the property, but they tended to avoid the people. It could have been a bear, but shit, we never went back up the hill at night. No way, no how. Never saw that thing again. Might not seem like much, but to 11-year-old me, I had a new face of fear that still scares me shitless to this day. I was on my first real date with my now husband, backpacking up Mount St. Helens. We stayed over at this little shelter called Bolt Camp, which was about five to six miles off the beaten path. You can Google it. You'll see some pics of it with a downed tree that took out part of the shelter. That is the way it was when we stayed there. It's a beautiful hike in. The sun was setting as we were nearing the camp. Most of it is dirt path, but there are a number of places where there are little wooden bridges. Every time we'd cross one, we'd say, watch out for trolls. Many of the trees had hollows at their bases, and as the sun went down, it would shine through them, creating the illusion that they were little hobbit or fairy houses with tiny fires burning at tiny hearths. As it got dark, we started seeing phosphorescent mushrooms, glowing in eerie green. It's a really neat little shelter. Dirt floor, but probably big enough for six people to sleep in. Sands the down tree. I think it has been rebuilt since. The last people left a half bottle of scotch behind, which we partook of. When we left, we left some weed and a few bottles of water behind. Kind of a take something, leave something little place. Anyway, we went to sleep in the shelter. He was towards the entrance and I was towards the back. I woke up at some point. It was pitch black, of course. I was facing towards the back of the shelter when I saw it. It's hard to describe. It looked like a spider web floating through the back of the shelter, sort of a geometric shape floating around, changing shapes and sort of flipping over and swapping end to end. I wasn't afraid of it. In fact, I really enjoyed watching it. I'm an atheist and don't believe in ghosts, but I laid there thinking that it must have been some kind of spirit. I wanted to wake him up so he could see it too, but I didn't know him that well and figured he'd think I was crazy or wouldn't be able to see it. Anyway, I watched it for a few minutes then drifted back to sleep. A couple of months later, we were talking about our trip and I finally told him about it. His mouth dropped open. Apparently, the very next night after we returned, he was outside of his house having a smoke when he saw a thing that matched the description exactly, floating and drifting along. It finally sort of poofed out of existence in front of a bush. In its place were glowing red eyes. It did freak him the hell out, so he noped back into the house. We never saw it again after all that.
Around 18 months ago, when my girlfriend and I first got together, we went camping regularly with a couple of friends in a large ancient forest. We would go in, set the tent up in the light, have a barbecue and some beers, then sleep. Well, our friends would. We went several weeks running. Same routine, different friends each time, etc. Until one night, we decided to leave the tent and return later so we could get some more supplies. We returned to the tent at dusk, but found a stick figure made from twigs at the entrance of the tent. We smoked a bit, had some booze. One of our friends, who reluctantly joined us on this occasion, turned strange. He disappeared into the woods, which we found strange as he was petrified on the way into the woods. And then we could hear nothing but singing for at least an hour. He eventually returned and we continued to party until it started to rain heavily, at which point we decided to call it a night. We woke up in the morning and decided to pack the tent down. It eventually became obvious that the trees surrounding our tent had the same shape as the figure carved into the bark. We pretty much rushed the hell out of there and came across a still burning pit of fire surrounded by fallen trees. That was the final straw, so we ran the remaining mile back to my car. I have to add that the woods I'm talking about has a history of deaths and suicide, and also had reports of witchcraft too. In fact, the surrounding 20 miles has quite a lot of stuff just like that. I've spent various stretches of time backpacking and camping throughout the U.S. and seen some rather strange things. My brother and I came across an abandoned trailer town of sorts that scared the hell out of us. We also came across a rundown town, really, really small, out in New Mexico that seemed to have one person living in it. We based that on the fact that there was still some food and supplies there that were fairly fresh perhaps just a few days old. Spent a couple days there trying to find the person, just to find out why they were staying in the town. Never found anyone. We found the skeletal remains of an unknown number of deer, ranging from bucks to fawn, ensnared in a barbed wire fence that encompassed a 10 by 10 area in the Ozarks. A few of the skulls topped the fence posts, and there was one post in the middle of this area that had decaying deer bodies. Looked to be two, but there were only six hooves jutting out of the wreckage, wrapping around it. We found a dummy hanging from a tree while in the Yukon Territory of Canada, literally out in the middle of the woods. No reason for it, as far as we knew. And we also came across a dead junkie on a road out of Olympia, obvious overdose, as he had his arm tied and a needle in his hand. His eyes were glazed over and staring straight ahead, mouth slightly ajar. Last year, I was with a buddy of mine, and we were going to the Hart Creek Scramble in Alberta. But due to some health conditions he has, it was going too strenuous to complete and we figured we'd make it an easy day and do the simple trail. Now we're both climbers and have been to Hart Creek for rock climbing in the past and had a great time. So it wasn't a surprise to see the sporadic climbers on the mountainside as we went. Hart Creek is also pretty popular and easy for people who just want to go for a nice nature walk and maybe have a picnic. Anyway, so we walked in, enjoying the day watching climbers on our way by. We saw a couple even doing some multi-pitch climbing, which means basically leapfrogging up the route. We settled in for lunch about a half hour later and left a couple of hours after that. On our way back, I remember seeing a climbing shoe in the creek and thinking, oh, someone must have lost this. I picked it up when my buddy got my attention and I looked further downstream. Both climbers, a young man, 
29 or so I learned later, and his partner were both lying in the creek bed, rope and harness that still attached, dead. It was very surreal. We had seen these people climbing not two hours before, making their calls, having a good time. The first reaction I had was that I remembered that there was a family right behind us, a husband and wife with a young daughter who were playing in the creek on the way down. We ran back and stopped them and explained as quietly as we could what was ahead. And before we knew it, Looky Loose had come by. It turned out that the husband was an off-duty RCMP officer, and so he took control of the situation. I learned later we weren't the first ones on scene and that the authorities had already been called. Needless to say, it was a very quiet ride back into town. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true camping horror stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.